Okay. <clears throat> All right, on behalf of the Center for Chinese Studies at UH Manoa, I would like to welcome everyone to our Spring 2023 CCS webinar series. Secondly, I would like to welcome every I would wish I would like to wish everyone a happy Chinese New Year, uh, which began on Sunday and marks the year of the rabbit, which is considered an auspicious sign in Chinese culture, representing longevity, peace, and prosperity. My name is Yuming Bao, being Bao Yu from the Department of East Asian Languages and Literature where I teach 20th century Chinese literature, film, and culture. And I'm currently also serving as the CCS director and the organizer of this year's webinar series with the kind assistance of the CCS executive committee and CCS associate <coughs> director, Zhen Yuei, Cindy Ning. Please note that today's session is being recorded and the file will be uploaded to our CCS YouTube channel, where you will also find previously recorded CCS <coughs> webinar sessions. Our full program flyer for this semester can be found on the CCS website and Instagram. And you can see the links to all three media platforms now in the chat forum. Today's session is also co-sponsored by the Richardson School of Law here at UH Manoa. We would like to thank and acknowledge them for their support. So before I introduce today's featured speaker and panelist, allow me quickly to go over some procedure reminders. Feel free to use the chat forum for posting technical or other queries, but use the Q&A tool for posting comments and questions to the speakers, which will be answered during the Q&A session. We kindly ask that you keep your comments concise and ask no more than two questions so that we can accommodate everyone and keep within the 30 minutes we have allocated to the Q&A session. We will try to take questions in the order they have been submitted but we might also synthesize or group together similar questions so that we save time and make space and room for other comments and queries. We further reserve the right to dismiss comments and questions that are not relevant or civil in tone. After today's session, you will receive a brief survey and we would greatly appreciate your constructive feedback. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our three speakers and today's book launch, an interdisciplinary panel featuring Dr. Daniel Vukovic's latest and much anticipated monograph entitled After Autonomy, a postmortem for Hong Kong's first handover, 1997 to 2019, published last September, 2022 by Paul Griff Press and available via Amazon. Dr. Vukovic has worked at Hong Kong, Hong Kong University since 2006 where he is currently the chair of the Dynamic Comparative Literature Program. He's also a research fellow at the Southeast University in Nanjing and a visiting professor at East China Normal University in Shanghai. He is the author of numerous articles and three critically acclaimed monographs, including China and Orientalism 2012, um, and the illiberal, uh, illiberal China, question mark, the ideological challenge of the People's Republic of China, published 2019 by Paul Grave in the China in Transformation series. His work is interdisciplinary, but turns upon issues of <clears throat> post-colonialism, politics, and critical theory in relation to the China and West relationship. We are also very fortunate today to have two respondents engaging Dr. Vukovic in a dialogue about his book, namely Dr. Carol Peterson and Dr. Tim Summers. Our first respondent will be Dr. Carol Peterson, who is a professor mm -hmm. at the Richards School of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She taught law in Hong Kong for 17 years, from 1989 to 2006, and continues to research Hong Kong's changing legal system. Her latest publication entitled, quote, Territorial Autonomy as a Tool of Conflict Resolution, Lessons from One Country, Two System in Hong Kong, end of quote, was published in 2022 in a special issue of the Academia Sinica Law Journal based in Taiwan. Our second respondent is Dr. Tim Summers of the Center for Chinese Studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Dr. Summers' teaching and research focuses on the international relations and political economy of contemporary China. And he currently is also a member of the Policy Research and Global China Program at his university. He teaches MA and BA courses and is presently serving as the director of the MA program. His recent publications include two books, China's Hong Kong, The Politics of a Global City by Agenda Publishing 2019 and 2021, 
And China's, China's region in an era of globalization, Rutledge, 2018, as well as journal articles on the Belt and Road Initiative. He's also authored a number of policy and research paper for Chatham House, which is an international affairs think tank. Both Dr. Vukovic and Dr. Summers are actually joining us live from Hong Kong, which is about 18 hours mm -hmm. ahead of Hawaii time. So it's actually eight o'clock in the morning for them. We will first invite Dr. Vukovic to give a 15 to 20 minute presentation on his new monograph, then invite each respondent to speak for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by a dialogue between them before we open the floor for comments and questions from the audience. So without further ado, let me turn over to Dr. Vukovic. Oh, great, thank you. Let me start my timer here too. I don't wanna run over. Um, I would like to begin by thanking uh, Ming Bao uh, very much for hosting this, and Cindy as well for your help in organizing it, and uh, also especially my respondents already in advance. So Professor Summers and Peterson, thanks very much for signing on and, and giving some thought to this, not just my book, but the general issue. And I'd like to thank as well uh, a friend and uh, colleague of mine, Jesse Knutson, over at uh, 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 Hawaii Manoa, who put me in touch with uh, Ming Bao as well. So I, what I will do is share a screen here. I don't have a uh, full PowerPoint. I just have a Word document, which kind of serves as an outline. And I'll, um, I can't get that over there. Excuse me, I don't wanna. Yeah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> I won't read the whole thing at everybody, uh, but we'll just kind of use this to go over the some of the highlights, if that's the right word, or main points I'm getting at. So um, I wrote this original idea behind After Autonomy was to kind of pick up where my second monograph ended by looking at uh, essentially the effects of globalization over the last couple of decades, you know, tied up to the rise of China, but also to the kind of decline of American hegemony and kind of global transformations more generally in this region and everywhere, uh, the effects of all of that on liberalism as a, which you'll understand as a kind of, you know, kind of the, the kind of dominant discourse of Western modernity or even global modernity uh, in a way, right? And uh, obviously I still talk about autonomy in this book, but basically it was gonna be a more theoretical project in a way, but uh, then basically 2019 happened, right? The, the protests, uh, erupted and the national security law, uh, and then even pandemic, of course, an even bigger story, which I just begin to kind of touch on a little bit uh, in the last chapter of this book, right? So I figured I had to intervene on this particular thing and it kind of changed <clears throat> what I would do. Um, so having been here through that, there are a few things that struck me by it, right? Of course, there's very much to say, but if my point was that, you know, autonomy was already being challenged in a sense by globalization, clearly um, in the last decade or two, uh, 2019 really kind of put paid to it in some ways uh, within Hong Kong, right? So I'm responding to that, but then also thinking of quite strongly what I take to be the kind of mediatization of that uh, protest movement, right? Uh, which was a massive global spectacle and the most broadcasted one, I think in, in history kind of live streamed at the same time, right? And yet, there was a kind of mediatization of it where the, you know, that, that kind of whole estate of the media frames it and it exerts in turn a real major influence, I think, on the, on the movement. And in my view, kind of framing it in terms of kind of political orientalism around China <clears throat> that objectifies China, but also Hong Kong itself and kind of tailors it in a particular way, okay? <clears throat> so I felt I had to uh, begin to unpack some of that and then also hook this up with for me, kind of longstanding uh, interest in post-colonialism, post-colonial theory, post-colonial studies, the 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 uh, impact of colonialism, but also maybe more interestingly, what its possible legacies and after effects are, things like that. So that's really all coming to bear uh, in my mind uh, on this event. Um, so, you know, the first part of the book looks in more detail at the protests themselves. I offer an account of it, which is not by any means trying to be exhaustive or, or even objective, but uh, I think trying to bring to light some aspects of it 
uh, that maybe aren't narrated as much uh, within it. So uh, the kind of two key contexts preceding that, I think, are or two events as well, are the Occupy Central Movement 2014, also kind of known as the Umbrella Revolution, and then later the Hmong Kok uh, Fishball Revolution, which is even shorter and in a way less than a revolution, but also perhaps more uh, significant. So Occupy, as you may well be aware, was ended uh, peacefully, right? Uh, it was different really than 2019, although there were arrests and it was a more kind of classic civil disobedience moment. Uh, but it ends without any positive result around what was taken by the protesters and much of that kind of pan-democratic mainstream as uh, its essential central demand, which was universal suffrage, which will be defined not just simply as voting, everyone voting, but as a direct nomination of the CE or, or chief or mayor or leader of the city which was not granted and which actually couldn't really be granted by the basic law, which I can get to uh, in a minute here too, the basic law itself, right? So I think that it ends peacefully, but I think there's an enormous amount of frustration at the end of that, both on the part of the participants, perhaps more broadly in the city around uh, the aftermath of that, not panning out to anything and actually a reform project or reform proposal launched by Beijing, which was to have the CE directly elected, but a choice for everybody between two candidates who were kind of vetted by the selection committee, which is also kind of stipulated in the basic law, right? So that was shot down as well. So I think there's a great deal of frustration already uh, in the city around that. Uh, the Mongkok event of 2016, actually uh, during a Lunar New Year, was significant for a number of reasons. One, it kind of upped the ante in terms of tactics. There were, there was violence in this particular one. So there was brick throwing at hygiene officers and then police who had to absorb it, who then got orders later to kind of strike back, uh, kind of break it up forcibly, I think with batons and such, right? So that kind of escalated as well, represents that. And at that point too, you really saw the kind of crystallization of a kind of more intensely nativistic or, or xenophobic um, uh, politics within that movement, right? So even more explicitly kind of anti-China in this sense, and even speaking more of uh, independence, right? Or secession from it, right? So that kind of perspective and that kind of rhetoric was legitimated so to speak, or, or, or articulated or used more at that particular moment. So that by 2019, basically, you're not, you didn't have just the, the kind of classic Hong Kong scenario of a very active civil society, lots of protests around this issue of suffrage, et cetera, but something else has happened, right? So that the, the uh, yeah, the rise of a kind of xenophobia and that type of a nativism, a secessionist movement, et cetera. It's, in a way, 2019, in retrospect, was this kind of perfect storm of ill winds, if you can put it that way, of uh, enabling this to, to kind of happen, right? A uh, couple other things I get at in this chapter, and I will move on from it quickly, I want to bring up. One is a, a, a critical account of the Bernism strategy there, where it was this kind of rhetoric of a kind of mutual destruction, right? If we burn, you burn with us, who's drawing on that Hunger Games, uh, uh, reference there, okay, uh, which I think was clearly a kind of mistake, basically, but a very key feature of the movement itself, okay. Uh, the, the movement was spontaneous and unorganized, particularly at first, but what that ended up being was an opportunity for not no leaders, but many leaders, right? So it kind of gets it is kind of unorganized and chaotic, and that both allows other people to step forward and kind of claim it or put in their usual business. Um, you know, pan Democrats, uh, activists like Joshua Wong, Jimmy Lai, those kind of people also came to basically occupy the center stage of the protests, right? Uh, and finally, the last thing I want to bring up here, because it's relating to decolonization, which I'll transition here to, is that. Uh, the chapter and the book in general tries to steer between two paths. One is a kind of full-on kind of endorsement, almost a kind of cheerleading of the movement, right? 
uh, on the one hand, that this was about a freedom struggle, period. This was a, a kind of classic democracy struggle. This was um, a response to Chinese repression and stealing its freedoms of Hong Kong and this kind of stuff. <clears throat> on the one hand, and then the kind of mainland media response to it, other than bringing up some things around living conditions in Hong Kong, was essentially to write this off as a question of uh, an attempted color revolution and kind of foreign imperialism and funding, right? Whereas my point in here is actually this is very much a homegrown uh, problem and a homegrown um, Hong Kong and Hong Kong China uh, event, right? and it has to be understood as that, right? So even if there is funding to it, which there was foreign funding and things like that, it really doesn't help to explain that movement itself, which has to be, take us back to the basic law, I think, and, and issues of kind of colonial legacy and so on, right? So I think as far as imperialism is really very germane in terms of driving that movement, it's really through the media and how it's kind of framed it and how that, I think that in turn emboldened the protesters to do things like solicit US sanctions and law and things like that, and also, and get them, right, receive them, and then also kind of force the hand of Beijing to do something, uh, uh, more drastic or more decisive to make sure that doesn't happen again, right? Okay, um, so now let me talk about uh, a bit here more quickly on the kind of colonial uh, aspects of this. So let me do at least the basic law and uh, a little bit more around, I think, hopefully state capacity or the economy here, which are the kind of main points I'm trying to get at. So the, it seems to me that this event and the previous movement is really defined by some of the contradictions within the basic law system itself, right? And we could say there's maybe three of those, okay? Um, I think that the major one was this notion of two systems, which at the time of the drafting and its discussion in the 80s was essentially around the system saying that the Chinese system of socialism will be kept separate from the Chinese system of capitalism for this period of 50 years. And if you keep that, that will, that separation in place, then you will ensure and underwrite that period of autonomy, that that's exactly what will define it, okay? Now, the problem with this, uh, maybe it's easier to see in retrospect, is that there was no way to keep that particular genie in the bottle, the, the genie of a kind of Chinese economy, uh, call it capitalism, call it socialism if you wish, but the fact that it's growing and is essentially going to make that relation, the political economic relation between the two places uh, even more enmeshed and embedded, right? So that will have carryover effects on any kind of autonomy you might want, right? Uh, the other things, frankly, in the document are that it has other contradictions. One is around uh, the promise of suffrage according to democratic procedures, but then also, as I mentioned earlier, insisting on the selection process, a vetting process of those candidates. The mainland perspective really wanted to insist on Article 23, national security legislation, and the, the pan-democratic side, mainstream side, let's even say mainstream political, kind of liberal side, if you will, of, of Hong Kong, of course, wanted to focus on that question of suffrage and voting. Right, But if you have a stipulation of sovereignty, political sovereignty, and even of jurisdiction of the mainland over that, you're setting up a kind of contradiction between that and this notion of autonomy and, and, and uh, uh, suffrage, right? So basically what this amended, this allowed both sides to kind of dig in and ignore one another's emphasis. So if the mainland saw this as a period of a kind of slow integration, under some kind of banner of autonomy. I think the Hong Kong side, the 50 year period saw this as a kind of de facto full autonomy and kind of staving it off, right? So it was bound to kind of come to a head, okay? And I think in short, that's kind of what happened with this. So I think that um, it follows from this, what I'm saying about the economy on this, that, uh, the, for decolonization to go forward, it's gonna to have to resolve this kind of contradiction around the two systems, the, the economics of the relationship between the two places, right? So of course, Hong Kong takes up 
uh, through its heritage as a kind of laissez-faire liberal capitalist experiment within British colonialism, um, that commitment to a free market kind of based society and using that to um, resolve everything. Okay, so I think that's one arena that's gonna have to change and uh, progress on that front towards a more kind of maybe market led, but kind of regulated uh, development, economic, even capitalist development will actually in some ways represent a move towards decolonization for the city, right? And there have been um, a, and a number of announcements and, and plans made and gestures made towards this, right? So for greater livelihood and prosperity, kind of more, I wanna almost say socially democratic kinds of development within Hong Kong, certainly compared to uh, previous eras. So around the, the metropolis, the Northern metropolis, creation of a basically a whole new metropolitan town center uh, up closer to the border, one in Kowloon, also a kind of major housing project, a land reclamation project being announced, uh, these kinds of things, as well as this kind of greater Bay Area uh, plan to yoke Hong Kong's economy and development in the future with its kind of bordering cities in uh, Guangdong, right? Shenzhen, Macau, and so on, right? So you see that, and you see a kind of change in rhetoric coming from uh, officials, even from the finance secretary, in a way talking about things like uh, one reference, like we have to divide the cake well. They'll use some of like Xi Jinping rhetoric around common prosperity and livelihood and things like that. So, and I think that, you know, we don't really know if this is all going to work or if it will really happen, but nonetheless, uh, it really represents a massive change from things that would have been said before 2019, 2020. Okay. So there's an economic front of decolonization that needs to materialize. And I think that hopefully uh, there's signs for it. The other thing really quickly that I'll get into on this is this kind of question of political decolonization, right? So if, if the economic aspect of decolonization has always been kind of put in the corner, not talked about so much, right? Not just in the basic law, but also in post-colonial studies and cultural studies in many ways. Right, that's kind of coming back in a vengeance now as a result of all of this. But there's also the political question, right? So um, this is in a way trickier, okay? So let me try to telegraph it here. <clears throat> One of the effects of colonialism, I think, in, in Hong Kong is a kind of political underdevelopment of the state or the society, partly because it's a market-based kind of fantasy, right? Um, and that this lack of a kind of political class and of state capacity to act more like a state that can intervene or get things done or do things, so-called big government, basically, the lack of that was really exposed during that final wave of the Omicron virus, right? Uh, that I get into in this last chapter a bit, right? That too, there's been gestures towards kind of correcting this, right? It's going to be a long process, but I think it's going to be really fundamentally important, a change in the kind of governmentality or mode of governance within Hong Kong. Okay. <clears throat> um, the other question around this with, excuse me, I was looking at a chat question, uh, which I'll get to later, hopefully, but um, the other kind of political question that comes up with her in relation to decolonization has been some of the, the, the kind of reforms that have been happening, right? So I basically say there's two things that are true right now. One is that some of these reforms to the legislature uh, in particular have been effective, right? In terms of getting some kind of perhaps low hanging fruit, but important things taken care of in the city in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of battling Omicron, that last one, bringing in like mainland advisors, things like that, uh, streamlining bureaucratic processes, approving some of these housing plans, um, trying to get public housing built more quickly, stuff like this, okay? That coexists with a clear kind of um, repression, if you will, a kind of uh, elimination of certain political freedoms that were here in the city before 2019 or during 2019. 
right? I mean, you know that legislatures kind of change. The, the pan-democratic parties are largely gone. There's like one or two so-called oppositional people who were elected last time who were in the government. Now that may expand in the future, okay? But they've clearly kind of taken that away, right? So I think another thing that's on the agenda vis-a-vis -a, -vis a kind of decolonization politically is further changes to this kind of received colonial era uh, political system, right? Which will have to allow for some form of social political participation within the city if it's really gonna ameliorate some of its grievances, contradictions, problems, right? If, if one of the things that needs to happen to go forward is a kind of uh, development of a new kind of Hong Kong identity that's somehow integrated with China and less hostile to it, not that this was total in the city anyway, right? Then clearly things like that, vehicles of participation, political and social, not just voting, but otherwise, will have to, have to uh, materialize, right? Whether it's through organizations, consultations, what have you, right? So you know, basically the, the kind of political uh, backlash or repression on the one hand can happen, but also in other ways, some kind of signs of kind of like political progress in terms of the functional quality of the government are happening. So basically two things can be true is what I'm saying in that bit, right? So that takes me to 20 minutes. I wanna wrap up there, but uh, there's other stuff in there, of course, about decolonization, but I think that these are really gonna be main fronts I think in the current and in coming years, right? Uh, the economic question and the state capacity participation question. So I will stop the share on that. And thank you very much. Great. All right. Do you, Ming Bao, do you want him to answer any questions first or do you want me to go ahead and give my comments? Yeah, why don't you start with your response? Yeah, okay, please. thank you. All right. So I, I do see one interesting question in the Q&A. We are in 2023, who exactly are you decolonizing from? <laughs> and and I think it's it's fair to think about that. Um, I, I enjoyed your book very much. Um, I look at it from the perspective of a lawyer, which is very different. Um, Decolonization does have a legal dimension, particularly in international law. And one thing to bear in mind is that the central government of the PRC has never really wanted to talk about Hong Kong in the context of decolonization because Beijing's position from the moment Beijing took Taiwan seat in the UN which was legitimate, but their position was that Hong Kong and Macau were not colonies, that they were Chinese territory occupied by foreign powers. And from their point of view, it was simply a territorial swap. It had nothing to do with decolonization. And the reason Beijing took that position is that under international law, under the UN Charter and under customary international law that was binding on China at that time, had they viewed it as decolonization, that meant you would have to look at the people of Hong Kong who numbered 4 million by the early 1970s as a colonized people who had rights under international law. And under international law, if the people of Hong Kong had been recognized as a colonized people, then the UN would have been obligated to conduct a plebiscite at some point and ask them what they wanted for their future choice. Now, it's not necessarily the case that they would have gotten their choice because China, of course, had a competing territorial claim, particularly with respect to the new territories, which was only leased to the United Kingdom, whereas Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula were in theory ceded in perpetuity to the British government. So had the UN stayed involved, it's possible that autonomy might have been the negotiated outcome. It's possible that it would have been full integration with China. 
it's possible it would have been some other arrangement, but it would have under international law have had to have included some sort of consultation with the people at the time. And indeed, Hong Kong was on the UN's list of non-self-governing territories from you know, over 20 years. It was only because Beijing insisted that it be removed and China had a great many friends on the UN Committee on Decolonization. And they agreed. They proposed that Hong Kong be taken off the list. It went through the General Assembly without even any discussion. The people of Hong Kong didn't even know this was being done. To a large extent, the responsibility for that rests with the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom said nothing. Although, ironically, after the General Assembly approved without even looking at it, this, this it was sort of tacked on to a big report. After Hong Kong was removed from the list of non-self-governing territories, the British government sent a letter to the United Nations saying, of course, this doesn't change anything, right? <laughs> and in fact, Hong Kong was still treated as a British dependent territory until the handover in 1997. So it was like this fiction from the point of view of the British government, and much of the international community, Hong Kong was a dependent territory under British colonial rule. But from the point of view of Beijing, uh, it was just Chinese territory unlawfully occupied, and we're going to get it back in 1997. So we don't have to talk about decolonization. And so I think, unfortunately, that discussion was never had. Um, and what that resulted in is the Sino-British Joint Declaration, a bilateral treaty negotiated in secret with no representation from the people of Hong Kong. And I think that is really the root cause, if you will, of some of the contradictions that you have pointed to in your book. Um, clearly, the Joint Declaration was very specific about many things, unbelievably specific, in fact. Um, right down to you get to keep your same currency, you're going to have a separate custom zone. I mean, for all practical purposes, it almost looked like independence. Many of the powers that we would associate with an independent state, but because there were the details were not there on local democracy, it meant that it could be appear to be a very high degree of autonomy, but because the powers would be exercised by a government that was essentially appointed from Beijing, it was not really what we would call in international law internal self-determination, right? The idea that you can be part of a larger state, have autonomy, but because you have local democracy and a certain opportunity to exercise your own culture and practice your own culture, you have internal self-determination, which is often in international law considered to be a fair compromise in situations where the normal rights of a colonized people are not being fulfilled because there is a competing territorial claim, which China certainly had. So I think some of the contradictions that you pointed to, they go right back to that scenario, the exclusion of the Hong Kong people, and I would say the deliberate attempt to mislead them as to what they had been promised. Um, and if you look at what the British government and the colonial government officials said to the people of Hong Kong after the joint declaration was negotiated, it was designed to reassure them not only that there would be this very separate, and I would say not just economic system, but separate legal system. They were not only reassured of that, they were reassured about local democracy. The details were not there in the joint declaration, but the British government did not want to tell the people of Hong Kong that they were not there because they couldn't get the Chinese negotiators to agree to it. And so instead they misled them essentially. And while the joint declaration was being promoted to the Hong Kong people in 1984, at the same time, the colonial government issued a green paper on local democracy, which had those reforms gone through, Hong Kong essentially would have been operating as a parliamentary democracy. The legislative council would have been elected and the, the chief executive in the executive council would have been selected from the majority party. The Hong Kong people were led to believe that they were going to be exercising 
local democracy well before 1997. And as soon as the joint declaration was ratified in 1985, all of that was put on the back burner. And I will say the Chinese government didn't object in 1984 and not right away. They let that consultation go and I think go forward. And I think it's because Deng Xiaoping actually wanted a smooth transition. He wanted an intact economy. He didn't want the Hong Kong people to be objecting in that transition period. So at the end of the day, we're left with a, a bilateral agreement with no possibility for neutral enforcement. All It is a, bi, a binding treaty, but there's absolutely nothing the British government can really do to enforce it. There's nothing the Hong Kong people can do to enforce it. So where does that leave us then? Um, I do disagree when you say that the protesters in 2019 were arguing for de facto independence. I don't think that's what most protesters were asking for. I think they were asking for restoration of what they thought that they were promised. And I do agree with you, however, that we had this stalemate, unfortunately, from, from 2003 when the first national security bill was rejected until 2020. We had this stalemate where the Hong Kong, many people in Hong Kong were saying we can't legislate for Article 23 of the basic law until we have suffer universal suffrage. And the reverse was being said from Beijing. And it's very unfortunate because I and many academics argue that it would have been smart for local politicians and local lawyers to draft Article 23 legislation well before <laughs> Uh, that period. So, and to take the bill that was proposed in 2002 and 2003 with the concessions that Tung Shiwa offered to the people and clean up some of the messy drafting, because some of the drafting wasn't very good, and put it forth to the Legislative Council. And I think if the various political parties in Hong Kong had found a way to work together and get the Article 23 legislation implemented through local legislation, the outcome might have been better. I honestly don't know. It's it's very hard to know because I think a lot of things have changed in China since then as well, right? So we're we're operating in a somewhat different environment. So what I think we have to think about is what will happen now going forward. It's interesting that you emphasize the inevitability inevit of economic integration. And I think there's a lot to support what you say. Interestingly, however, the central authorities and the Hong Kong government do seem to want to continue to tell the international business community that we're different, we're autonomous. And I think one of the most interesting indicators of that is the little spat that was held at the WTO, the World Trade Organization recently. So one of the indicators of Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy has always been that Hong Kong has separate membership in the World Trade Organization. And for a long time, that meant that many foreign countries treated Hong Kong as a separate legal jurisdiction, not just a separate economic jurisdiction, but a separate legal jurisdiction from mainland China. Hong Kong, Hong Kong could import certain things that China, mainland China could not import. Now that changed recently in part because many foreign governments lost confidence in the autonomy. And one of the bad things I think that Donald Trump did, one of the many bad things he did was he instituted this executive order saying that goods coming from Hong Kong to the United States must be labeled made in China, not made in Hong Kong. And in a short article I published critiquing some of the sanctions that the Trump administration instituted, I said that had to be the, the most foolish. It wasn't going to do anything to improve the situation for Hong Kong people. And it was just sort of a slap in the face. I wondered what the Hong Kong government would do in response. And they filed a protest. They filed a complaint with the WTO and they recently won. Uh, the W, I was not so sure that they would, would win because I think it is questionable whether Hong Kong's customs 
authority <laughs> is really separate from mainland China's now? I'm not really sure. And I'm not sure that a lot of foreign countries believe that it's a completely separate customs territory. But the WTO said that the United States government was wrong in saying you cannot, you're not going to recognize Hong Kong as a separate territory. You do have to allow them to label their goods made in Hong Kong. It may seem like a small thing, but I think it's an indicator of something. And that is, for whatever reason, I don't think the central government wants to present to the world the image that Hong Kong is losing all of its separate status. Maybe because it, of its capital market, its ability to raise foreign capital, uh, maybe for other reasons, it apparently is to the advantage of the central government to continue to present Hong Kong as a separate legal system. And that means, in theory, an independent legal profession, an independent judiciary. Um, even the national security law that was imposed in 2020 says that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights will still be enforced in Hong Kong, although mainland China is not bound by that treaty. Hong Kong continues to report to the Human Rights Committee at the UN, which mainland China does not do. For whatever reason, China still seems to want to present Hong Kong as an autonomous region. So I raise that question for you, and I know I need to conclude them out of time. How does, if China's not going to pursue complete reintegration, how does it make Hong Kong function politically? And I would suggest that they do have to find a way to give their local government more legitimacy with the people. And maybe that doesn't mean open nomination, but some form of local election, because right now the local government is perceived as getting all of its legitimacy from Beijing and none from the local people. And I do think that's one of the reasons that they do not have effective governance. Thank you very much. I'll finish up my comments. Great. Um, thanks very much to uh, Dan and Carol for starting a very stimulating uh, discussion and to the organizers for inviting me to join this panel uh, this afternoon, this morning, uh, wherever you are. Um, I read uh, Dan's book back in December, uh, actually, and, and hugely enjoyed it, as I've enjoyed uh, much of his previous writing. Um, and I think, first of all, sort of like to um, commend him really for tackling what remains a very difficult, emotive, um, you know, almost traumatic period for many of us living in Hong Kong. I think there is, you know, there's a long way for us to go collectively to work through what happened in 2019 uh, and subsequently. Um, and I think uh, Dan's book does um, a, a very good job of setting out a view, which in, in his words goes, um, reads Hong Kong against the grain. You know, it's not, it's not the standard narrative that we're used to of Hong Kong uh, in English, uh, at least. Um, and I think that's uh, a, a, great, a great value for the book. So I hope people watching this uh, live or subsequently will take time to, to dip into it and to think about how reading Hong Kong against the grain might look um, from a you know a critical uh, perspective. And I wanted to, to structure my comments around three scales, the local, the national, and the global, which is how I've come to think about what's go gone, gone on in Hong Kong over recent decades. And again, to go to the, the, the book, I, mean, uh, I think Dan is quite modest in saying it's not an exhaustive or objective account. And he, I think, rightly acknowledges that, that he, like everybody else, comes from somewhere. We all have a perspective on what's going on. But I think there's a huge amount of, um, of, of detail and uh, insight there in the description of what's uh, gone on in 2019. I think, you know, I'd probably right and fair to say, as, as Dan did in his comments, that this is a homegrown problem. But I think we've also um, seen from the, the, the comments from Carol, from other parts of what Dan said, from the, the global context that he places the analysis in, that this is not just a homegrown problem. It's, a, it, it's an issue that has long, complex historical roots. 
um, the relationship between Britain and China going back into the 19th century, uh, as well as the more recent history that Carol has touched on uh, in her her comments, um, and very much the context of globalization. And I think that's a that that's a good um, perspective um, in the in the book from which to think through some of these crises and contradictions that have faced Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong as this sort of neoliberal uh, point in um, an intensifying globalization from the 1970s, 80s uh, onwards, um, one that's shaped Hong Kong very much as an international financial center, as a, as, as a trading uh, hub uh, and so on, but also one that has um, its um, it, it's political and social and ideological uh, legacies. And uh, I think that um, for me, one of the things I, I enjoyed about the book was the way that um, liberalism is brought into the mix, liberalism or neoliberalism perhaps, but, but liberalism more often, I think, in, in, in the book as um, a, 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 you know, a feature of that development of Hong Kong in its historical and global uh, context, but one that has... Um, uh, gained very, very deep, profound roots within uh, much of local society. Um, so, um, yeah, that's my that that that's my first comment. I think the other the the other thing I'd like to say about the the local um, aspect of this is, um, and again, it's I'm being nice about the book, uh, Dan. Sorry to keep saying good things, um, but um, you know, I, I think you 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 really bring out very well that there's more than one side to the story, and I think you do in your book um, give plenty of insight into both both sides or, or, or more of that story locally, which uh, makes it a, a, a valuable resource to read. But uh, again, I think that's something that is often not really um, reflected on and, and captured uh, well enough in much of the, 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 the commentary um, on Hong Kong recently uh, outside um, uh, Hong Kong, the commentary in the English language. So let me move on a little bit to talk about the national, um, the national level. Um, and again, in the, in, in the book, Dan, you talk a lot about poor understanding of China and some of the ways that that has fed some of the division. You talked about the xenophobia um, and, and so on, some of the rather less pleasant features of the way that Hong Kong politics uh, has developed. And I think I'm probably more inclined to agree with um, with, with, with Dan than, in, than with Carol on the on the nature of the movement. I'm, the, the the movement, like every movement, has a range of people involved with it with a range of views, and I'm I'm sure it's. Um, you know, it is certainly true that many believed they were simply calling for what had been promised to, to them in the past. But I, I also think there was a very, you know, a very strong um, wing of that uh, social unrest in 2019 that was calling for things that went well beyond the constitutional settlement that Hong Kong was offered, whether that settlement is good or, or, or not, or could have been different historically, um, going beyond that, not just in terms of, um, of, of calls for democracy, but in terms of the relationship with uh, the sovereign power, the question of whether uh, Beijing had any legitimate role in Hong Kong uh, affairs and so on. And most provocatively, when those came out in, in terms of the calls for independence, which were, you know, were, were a regular feature around the city in 2019 is clearly part uh, of the movement. Um, Perhaps um, but also on the on 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 the national um, uh, level, um, I think. Uh, um, let me yeah, let me say that I, mean, I think Ch China has clearly has has clearly changed. And perhaps one thing that has come to be more obvious after the movement is the extent to which Hong Kong's future does depend on what is going on in China. I think that's also been um, a feature of Hong Kong uh, as a colony right from the start. You know, the reason the British um, took Hong Kong in the first place was not because of its uh, um, its its local features, but because of its utility in the the, the China trade, and that was what drove things uh, all the way through. Whether it was in the in the Cold War um, or, or more recently, but I think we're now in a in a phase where China's future and the prospects for development in China are are going to be much more key to Hong Kong's uh, future, whether that's in the Greater Bay Area um, or more broadly. So looking at and trying to understand what is going on in China in a um, in an objective way, what is going on at the national level becomes um, even more important 
uh, for Hong Kong uh, and Hong Kong society going forward. And I, I particularly like there's a bit in the the middle of the book about the politics of, of knowledge, where Dan talks about the role of universities in that. Perhaps that might be something we come back to a little bit uh, in our discussion in sort of crafting understanding and narratives of, uh, of China that are, are, are helpful and objective and not sort of inherently anti-regime. -re so thinking about China's future um, is clearly key. And then finally, um, a, a, the global uh, level, which um, you know I've touched on, and perhaps I would, um, you know, it, I would see the, the the current global context as perhaps a little bit more of a factor in shaping the um, developments in Hong Kong over recent years than than, than either of um, either Dan or Carol have done in their in their comments, um, at least, and particularly the intensifying U.S.-China rivalry or hostility, which is is, is clearly touched on uh, in in the book, and you know absolutely shapes the analysis. But I think you know that's something that may not be. Um, you know, it may not be a, the, the the source or the instigation of the, the the movement and the discontents that drove it, but it's something that very much shaped the way that that movement developed through 2019 and has shaped the way that Hong Kong's um, uh, positioning is 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 going to be um, evolved uh, going forward. And, you know, the features of 2019 were very overt um, calls on the US to intervene, calls for sanctions, um, you know, the prevalence of, of, of flags, of posters around Hong Kong, including on our campus, um, calling for that. Um, internationalization of the movement. Now, that wasn't something that started with 2019. I think that was a conscious strategy of the pan-democratic um, camp, particularly perhaps some of the slightly more radical or uh, elements in that after 2014, right, to internationalize Hong Kong politics, I think um, something that was uh, strategically uh, decided on. And um, uh, it, it, it led or it has led to a a much greater confrontation between the US and China over Hong Kong. And I think this is one way in which Hong Kong finds itself in a very different position. So I, I, I agree with Carol about the central government's desire to retain Hong Kong's distinctiveness, or I think perhaps you might put it slightly differently from me, but to, to, to emphasize the different legal and, um, and, and commercial identity of Hong Kong. But I think one of the big changes we have after 2020, after the national security law, is that Hong Kong finds itself in um, in the midst of a stark opposition between Washington and Beijing, between Beijing and other Western capitals, um, in a way that it never had done. And one of the uh, I mean, whether you think the handover settlement was a good one or not, one of the features of it was that um, pretty much everyone internationally was was buying into this as being the best solution available at the time, or at least a reasonable solution available at the time for ensuring a transition of sovereignty, Hong Kong Policy Act in the United States, uh, and so on. And that kind of broad consensus internationally about Hong Kong uh, has broken down. We now have the West and and China, or perhaps the West and the rest, actually um, in opposition over uh, over Hong Kong. Uh, our domestic consensus, our local consensus here, has rather uh, broken down too under you know a more sort of coercive approach following the national security law. Um, those. Um, those sweet spots which Hong Kong occupied for many, many decades up until 2019 um, are, are no longer with us. So um, we face a new challenging future ahead. And I think um, you know, Dan, Dan's book does a great job at outlining some of the features of that and also looking at some of the ways forward moving sort of decolonializing from liberalism in a sense if i understand you correctly to say you know we need to we need to move away from uh, a neoliberal approach to you know thinking the market rules and the, and, a, and a small state is um is okay to build up state capacity actually to address the real problems of livelihood and development which are not the only things that hong kong needs to address but very much at the core um, of what's required to build a better future for this city. So um, let, let me stop there. Great. Okay, great. Um, Daniel, Daniel, do you want to respond to some of um, Tim's uh, uh, 
and Tara, especially before we go to the sure. Q&A. Actually, I think you have about, yeah, sp spend about 10 minutes to respond. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And uh, thanks, Carol and Tim, both for that. I think like if, if you know, having written this book, if it does nothing else than produce your kind of responses and that kind of dialogue, then I'm, I'm just so happy because I, I couldn't ask for much uh, better. I think you all understand this better than I do in many ways. I mean, what I tried to do in the book. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just do a, a couple of things. It's both really rich responses and thank you. So uh, begin at the kind of beginning or end of uh, what Carol was saying. There's so much there, I think, to agree with. And you, you recap that process of the handover and I think what was going on with that, I think that uh, very well, right? Um, when it came to 2019, I think that, I, I think that, you know, traditionally, you know, we're all kind of, the three of us familiar, I think, deeply in some ways with Hong Kong and the kind of variety of opinion maybe, even within that kind of democratic uh, mainstream, even though it all gets kind of lumped up as one. I think there were certainly people who do, uh, who felt like probably in 2019 and certainly before um, that, you know, they were promised certain things that they're not getting. So they want that to be restored, right? That's their understanding. They didn't necessarily want to be independent from China, but they they wanted this or something like that. So there is that level of it, right? But I think that that those voices got pushed out. And that as, as Tim was saying later, like that within 19, you really had to kind of more quote unquote radicalized take on some of the stuff um, that was happening, right? And that pan-democratic movement, if you look, look at it more detail, it's self-splintered so much, even in the time I've been here uh, over this, right? So that even within the kind of like, there were people leaving the civic party who found it too xenophobic and that's the barristers party. You know what I mean? It's like, and so there's other groups who are really kind of out there like, like that going on. Um, Around the local elections, I, I also agree with that. So I think, um, and I, I noticed Carol had sent, I think they linked it in the comments, a really excellent article also on the national security law and kind of aftermath on that, right? Uh, and I, I looked at that um, uh, quickly a bit yesterday, finally, and then um, last night. But uh, as I said, that, that reform package that was offered probably should have been accepted in retrospect back right after Occupy. Because then you would have had a choice. You would have had some suffrage, basically. You would have had it choosing two candidates, which to be sure, not your ideal candidate uh, necessarily, right? But you at least have that bit of voice to choose uh, within the, the public sphere, something like that. So I would not be, I don't know when, but I think something like that will probably cycle back uh, to, to Hong Kong. Right, so it's not that direct nomination, but that for whatever that will be worth, um, uh, in that way too. The 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 I think around that. It's it's interesting. This came up. I'm sure uh, Carol and Tim are aware. This past summer there was was it spring around uh, that legal definition of colonialism or not? Right. This came around. I think some of the teaching in the public schools uh, in Hong Kong, whether it was a colony or not. This is going to be part of the guidelines, if not textbook or something like that. And then there was a lot of like <clears throat> tumult, briefly perhaps, in the in the media around what well, you're saying, Hong Kong was never really a colony. That's bizarre. So now you're denying was colonialism, right? Something like that. Uh, so it's it's really kind of a mess. And I, I think that's an important little bit to to notice on on that. And I think that, I mean, I don't know, but when I think look back at it at the time, I, they're using their connections within the UN. And this is the, the kind of late Maoist period where I think the politics of the party and the party state are very different than that of the 80s already, low on this kind of contemporary time. So I think there would have been different ways of seeing that kind of um, colonialism in its status. Um, so I think, you know, from their pers what I'm imagining is to be their perspective at the time, and maybe to some extent today, Hong Kong wasn't a real colony in the way that like India was, or, or you know, French, uh, French Algeria or something like that, right? It wasn't quite under that. And it was always just like this little territorial port state. So it always still kind of really belonged to us, or really part of this and it, that kind of thing, right? Um, and I can understand why they might be thinking of that. And, but I think the effects of that are also correct that, that Carol's rehearsing. This was not a matter of like a, a public debate or discussion. Um, 
and whatever the merits of that are, it, it did that. And then that basic law, even more so, more, much more crucially, the fact that it doesn't bring up this problem of colonialism and a need to decolonize really is something that comes back with a vengeance now. We can see that, right? And I think that there's a recognition, even if they're not going to use that exact word, of from the mainland and from the kind of ruling or power people, what are you gonna put them in, in Hong Kong and others that it does need to kind of go through some kind of decolonization, right? Unfortunately, that gets hung up on things like, well, let's not use English on the street names anymore or something, which is so minor, right? But it can, but I think there is a dawning awareness of that somehow, right? Just as there's this kind of pushback, I think, on this pure free market kind of thing. Oh, we have to keep a huge surplus. We cannot spend any money. There's a bit of, they've been forced to into that mode perhaps by the protests and then the pandemic. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that will uh, change a little bit uh, down the line on that. Um, I think what, uh, and quickly on Tim on that, uh, responding to Tim, um, I think that's a really useful way to kind of scale it. You say like the local, national uh, and global, right? Uh, to me, what's interesting about the, the the question of liberalism within that is it's not only part of the Hong Kong heritage, right, uh, as a governance and and kind of mainstream political intellectual ideology, uh, but th but that's of course also global as well as local. And then China has its own issues around dealing with liberalism, right? And it too has really had a very strong. Uh, faith in the kind of market mechanism, maybe not quite as much as Hong Kong. So I think one way in which, you know, Hong Kong is really bound up with uh, China for sure, and, and it always has been. But um, for it to also kind of succeed economically and push back on that, the same things on that kind of market-based rationality of governance, that's also going to have to happen um, or be retained at some level within, within the mainland as well. Right, so it's it's uh, going to be an interesting, I think, scenario to kind of watch out and, and see get played out here. Um, what's the other quick thing I wanted to say? The U.S.-China rivalry, I think, is really quite crucial to this uh, as well. And that kind of really, 2019 just forced that hand uh, in some ways. If it if it had been like Occupy eventually left. Right. You could say, okay, it failed in some sense, but in another sense, it didn't fail. It did what it did, and then it went away. Right, you take the win, if you want to put it that way, or take the loss, depending on how you feel about it. And that 2019, that didn't happen; it kept escalating, right? Um, and I think that's the kind of tragedy of it in some ways, from any number of perspectives. Uh, yeah. So, the autonomy of Hong Kong. Yeah, I think it's important to to do this. So, I'm sure you're aware when Xi Jinping was here in July for the handover anniversary, he talked about how great the basic law system was. Right. And how it's why would you change such a good system? Right. And he spoke of preserving Hong Kong's autonomy. And I think that we have to take that seriously. He means that. Right. It's not fake to him. He's not lying. He's not being a hypocrite. I think from that perspective, um, that is the case. So I think that they do want to preserve its autonomy in this sense. Right, perhaps to some extent a legal sense, at least in terms of dealing with with business things like that. But there are that's clearly in conflict now with that national security and kind of national sovereignty, which will imply some kind of compliance and and that. So there's still that kind of powerful contradiction um, that that's going to be there. But I I think that Hong Kong's autonomy is not all gone, and it's you know it, there's clear red lines now. And there's a lot of payback and kind of political struggle still around that in the past. But I, I don't think that there's the intent to simply suck it in and integrate it, right? So that, you know, that phrase of just another Chinese city has always been deeply tendentious, I think. Um, and it won't become that. Yeah. I think that's, that's all I'll say for now. I don't know. Other responses back or anything. Okay. Um, Carol or Tim, do you want to quickly respond to to Daniel? Um, yeah, I'd like to respond to Daniel and also something that Tim said. Um, this point about what was the movement about in 2019? Well, I think it's very complicated. I mean, I only was in Hong Kong for about two weeks in November of 2019. I did All of my events in Hong Kong, you were canceled because campus was shut down, but I was staying on campus. So 
I got to talk to a lot of students um, and a lot of people downtown. And I just think it was very complicated. Um, and I do think you have to remember that the movement started because of something really dumb that Carrie Lamb did. Um, and that was the extradition bill. It was not constitutionally required. I do not think there's any evidence to indicate that the central authorities asked her to do it. I think it was just her idea. And I think if she had been elected chief executive, she never would have done it. She would have had more political sense. And this is where I do agree with you. I mean, there is no state capacity in the local government. They they are not politicians and they don't understand how to respond to the people and how to anticipate certain how things could get out of hand. Um, so the beginning of the movement of 2019 really was very much like 2003. She's proposed something that we think is crazy, that completely violates one country, two systems. We're going to go to the streets because that's the only thing we can do because we can't vote her out of the office. And I think in the beginning, it was intended to be peaceful. And I think if she had been politically a little more wise and withdrawn the bill right away, just the way Tung Shi Wa did in the summer of 2003, I don't think it would have escalated. I don't think it would have turned into this pro-independence. And I, I still bristle a little bit when people call it pro-independence because I know so many people who were marching who who would have said independence crazy we can't possibly be independent from China so I do think it's a very complicated issue what the protesters were really seeking I do completely agree with you that the reform package that was offered um, should have been accepted. And there are plenty of lawyers who made that argument. I mean, Simon Young at Hong Kong U wrote a piece for South China Morning Post, I think it was, saying, let's accept it, let's work with it. It would have been better for Hong Kong, even if they were just choosing among three pre-approved candidates, because at least those pre-approved candidates would have had to have developed some political sense and been at least somewhat accountable to the people. And they would have had more political legitimacy, I think, and could have governed better. Um, so I think it was a mistake, but you know, if, if the central authorities were seeking my advice, which of course they won't, I would suggest, why not offer it again? Frankly, they could impose it now. They just remade le the Legislative Council in 2021. They have they've taken over complete authority for the makeup of Hong Kong's political system. If they wanted to, they could bring that into place now in Hong Kong, and perhaps it would help to rebuild the sense of Hong Kong people that we do get to exercise some internal self-determination and that we do have an accountable government that is understandably not just accountable to us, also accountable to the central authorities, but at least get some of its legitimacy from our vote. And I think that would be a wise move. And the other thing that I think would help would be just to lighten up a little on that national security law. <laughs> I mean, it's there's no question that there is no threat to China's territorial integrity coming from Hong Kong now. There is just no threat. There never really was a serious threat to China's territorial integrity. And the extent to which it has been enforced and the fear that it has instilled in many people, you can just feel it. Um, Look at, you don't have one Hong Kong Chinese person on this panel. And I think it would be interesting to see whether you could have found one who was willing to speak and whether they would feel comfortable responding to your book on a recorded seminar. You guys presumably both have citizenship elsewhere. I'm comfortably in Hawaii. Um, we can say what we want to say. I have former colleagues who don't feel that way anymore. They're being exceedingly careful with what they write and what they say. And I think that if the central authorities genuinely do want, and I agree with you, Xi Jinping seems to want to present to the international community the idea that Hong Kong's common law legal system is still intact, well, then the way to do that is to back off a little bit. Don't always oppose every bail application. I know that's coming from the Hong Kong prosecutors, but I suspect they're getting their marching orders somewhere. It's not, you don't always have to oppose bail applications, even though you have the power to do so. 
you don't have to be quite so aggressive in the enforcement of the law. Now that things have calmed down, it's just not necessary. And I, I think if they want to restore this idea that Hong Kong can exercise some sort of autonomy, some form of internal self-determination, those kinds of steps could go a long way toward reassuring the people of Hong Kong and also the international community, which I think China wants to believe certain things about Hong Kong. That's all I'll say. Okay, great. Um, we actually have just a comment came in from this person with the initial JS. I think this is in response to what Carol just said, so I'll just read it. I'm sorry, I understand you work at a Hong Kong uni. Oh, actually, that's for Daniel. <laughs> and you want to keep the job, but to promote Xi's opinion and to say he truly and to say he truly meant and believed in two systems is very wrong. The protesters were seeking freedom and basically fought the war that their parents uh, should have fought and did not and did not when they were sold by Britain down the down the river. It is it is said it is set free by birth people. It is set free by birth people want to ignore that people do not want to live under dictatorship. Okay, this is just a comment, but we actually have. Um, this person actually has asked um, two questions. I see Tim has already responded to the second one, but he can read it out himself. The first question, I guess it's for all three of you, both questions, I guess, is we are in 2023. Who exactly are you decolonizing from? And I think Tim answered that actually in his comments, right? When he discussed, uh, when he responded to Dan, it's uh, decolonizing for liberalism, right? I guess that's one answer. And or maybe Daniel and, and Carol want to respond to that. So let's take that question. We are now in 2023. Who exactly are you decolonizing from? And then the second question is for all three of you. And Tim has already typed in an answer, but that's fine. Why, in your opinion, did Britain return the islands and not just the new territory? Anyone? Well, the second one, I think, is fairly easy. Um, it The new territories do make up the majority of the land, of the of, if you look at the map of Hong Kong. And I think it would have been very difficult to govern just Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula without the new territories, because by that time, the new territories were not just little villages <laughs> and fish, fish ponds. They they had the new towns, right? Um, starting in the 1970s, they developed the new towns. And so you had lots and lots of people living in the new territories in Sha Tin, for example, and commuting into Hong Kong for school or into Hong Kong Island or Kowloon to work. So I think it would have been very, very difficult. Um, moreover, I don't think Deng Xiaoping would have agreed to it, right? I, I think he was insisting it's all coming back um, in 1997. And, and I have done some work in the British National Archives, and there, there are plenty of evidence to show that Maggie Thatcher thought about that idea, um, but that her advisors explained to her it simply wasn't going to work. Um, so I, you guys might have a different view, but I think that's the answer to that. Tim, do you uh, want to elaborate yeah. on your, or oh, maybe Daniel first? Uh, either one, if, if Tim wants to go first, please go right ahead, if there's any more to add. I don't really have anything to add. I mean, I totally okay. agree. I think I think the historical record's quite clear that the British view was that that it wasn't viable, um, both politically and in terms of, of local governance. I think Carol's absolutely right on that. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I certainly agree with that. But let me do the, the first part of that uh, question around uh, 2023, who or what would Hong Kong be decolonizing from? I don't think it's not who, but maybe it is a question of what, in the sense that it's uh, still this inherited received system from before that now China, in a way, is on the hook for. I agree, but to, to some extent, I mean, there's no, that's, and that's one of the points I want to make is that 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 this problem of decolonization and also political reform and state capacity, et cetera, this needs to be taken far more seriously than it has been, right? It's as if that just transferring sovereignty and putting Hong Kong people in charge of Hong Kong would represent decolonization. 
which is not the case, right? And of course they knew it was a colony despite what they're getting ratified legally as a technical definition, right? So I think that that's coming back, I don't say you could say to haunt them or now it's another opportunity to, to, to kind of do something about and think through. Um, but it's, it's from the past, right? So it, it, it is a kind of legacy uh, uh, situation. So you could say it's both or it's one, but I personally have never agreed or quite been able to say, well, Hong Kong is the colonizer uh, or excuse me, China is the Hong Kong of colon, the colonizer or recolonizer of Hong Kong now, because I think that kind of metaphorizes what colonialism is in some ways, right? And and it's not that kind of simple, right? Um, so I guess that's my take on that in particular. Uh, Make us speak to the thing about uh, getting the, the at atmosphere um, that Carol mentioned too around, you know, Tim and I are responding, presumably we are foreign nationals, so if they, we could always flee, something like that. Um, I think that's a, that's a valid point, and I think it's probably different for me than it would be for others. Um, I'll give a talk at uh, HKU on this. I don't know if we'll record it. I have to run that by respondents, and I've asked people to respond to other things. I will say that I'm um, still waiting to hear from one friend basically a Hong Kong person, I don't know if he or she will uh, agree to it. So I think that this could be also because they don't like the book, quite honestly, because it's it's not as, you know, um, maybe sympathetic to that particular struggle or what have you, 2019 as, as, as they are or something like that, right? So, but it could, it could be self-censorship. It's just like, well, it's not really worth the bother, et cetera. So um, I don't know. I would say, you know, in the classroom, um, I feel free uh, to talk about what I talked about before, right? But then I'm also not someone who particularly flirted with this kind of recolonization argument within like post-colonial studies about the, the status of Hong Kong and what's going on, that kind of thing. So it could be different for others. I, I think that's worth uh, acknowledging. Yeah, sure. Tim, do you want to elaborate on your your answer a little bit, or? Um, yeah, well, there's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of sort of <laughs> thoughts that are stimulated by those those comments from 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 colleagues, and I think you know, I mean, my my own feeling about working in Hong Kong is similar similar to Dan's. I feel that the classroom, for me at least, is a, is is a free space. Um, I mean, I think I also say not necessarily all students would feel the same, and there's a diversity of views about this. And I think, um, you know, we are still going through uh, a period of flux. Um, we're not quite you know we're not quite out of the 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 process of trans of, of transition from you know what 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 dan calls the first handover to the second handover whatever you like to call it and i think that will take some time i mean not least because when it comes to the national security law uh, very few of these cases have actually been through the courts um, and the ones that have been through the courts will be appealed and every point of law as far as i understand it every point of law is being argued particularly in certain cases by those with the you know the money to um, afford expensive lawyers um, one of the features of our legal system um, is that it's very expensive and very slow um, and that means it's going to take some time before we really come to a sort of settled point where where we can um, we can assess what the national security law actually means in practice for certain behaviors. Um, so we, we, we're still in this um, in this period of flux, and I think that's going to to take some some time. I also just wanted to go back because I think this question of the nature of the movement in 2019 is is an absolutely crucial one, and I'm sure it's one people are going to be writing about. And you know, there've the, the been a, a, a series of kind of political science type articles coming out in journals um, this year, last year, um, looking at different aspects of the movement, uh, use of violence, the implications of its sort of um, 
you know, say back up to the, the the kind of don't cut the match, right? You don't you 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 stay united. Um, and and you know, arguments, for example, that that really pushed the movement to a much more radical position that the radical wing was leading. And I think that's that that was my sense at the time, and that remains my view. But I think you know th these issues are going to be um, debated very substantially for for some period of uh, of time. But I mean, I think historically this is going to be absolutely crucial. You know what 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 was this? Was this um, simply a, a, a movement calling for uh, restoration or, or, or promised freedoms to be granted? Or was it something more radical? Was it something more xenophobic, more secessionist and, and so on? And I think we've seen from this discussion, there's, there's a range of views that are going to be, um, are going to be um, discussed much more uh, uh, over time. So I think that this remains a key, this will be a key historical question. Carol has her hand up, but we have one one question. Actually, Carol, do you? Can I just quickly respond yeah, to one just point? Just quickly, yeah. Because I I I agree with you about the "don't cut the mat" point. I think the the moderates made a huge mistake by not condemning the violence in 2019. Some of them did, but not in strong enough terms. It was a huge mistake. But what I where I do have to disagree with you is when you're you're suggesting that we don't know how the national security law is going to play out because we have all these appeals and we have this great legal system in a long time. Most people are incarcerated, pretrial detention, and they have they do not have the opportunity to leave their cells while they're waiting for all those appeals. And increasingly, we are seeing people pleading guilty. And I think in a lot of cases, it's because they have lost hope and they just want to get the anxiety over with. And the best example is the Tung Yi Kit case, where that man, you know, this young man who probably had no idea what he was doing, driving his motorcycle with his banner, uh, he got nine years and he dropped his appeal. And his barrister had no idea why he dropped his appeal. And from what I have heard, it's because he lost hope and was led to believe he'd be better off just dropping his appeal. He actually had a very strong grounds for appeal, I think, particularly on the incitement to secession charge. And I think that the trial court got it wrong, and I've written a critique of it. But we'll never know because his appeal will not be granted. So I think you cannot underestimate the impact of the reversal of the normal presumption in favor of bail on the way defendants behave. Okay, we have uh, one, the, our final question, and it's actually this is directed to uh, Tim and Daniel because Carol has already spoken, right? And this is from Francis Hiskin. If you could snap your fingers and have the Hong Kong government make one policy shift to gain more public legitimacy, what would that shift be? And he says, or she says, Professor Peterson has already answered with letting on on the national security law enforcement. But what would be, I, but I would be curious to see what Professor Summers and Professor Vukovic have to say. So if you could perhaps. Shall, shall I go first and then Dan can have the last word? Um, I mean, I suppose the, the probably the most common um, answer to this question is something to do with with housing, um, housing provision or or, um, you know, house prices. I mean, making more affordable housing available to young people in Hong Kong would seem to me to go you know, a, a, a long way to um, improving the quality of, of, of life and, and thereby enhancing uh, the government's uh, legitimacy. I mean, I think if we just think about it as government legitimacy, we slightly miss, miss, miss the point here. That, of course, is very difficult to do in the short term. There are other areas wh which could be addressed. I think um, primary, secondary schooling, um, the healthcare system, which, in, you know, ironically, well, it's not ironic because of what We've heard about the, the the neoliberal market oriented history of Hong Kong, but you know we have some of the best healthcare facilities in the world, but we also have some of the sort of most in, un, unequal and um, uh, and and you know, we we have some problems in our healthcare system as we've seen with uh, with with COVID, and I'm I'm not really an expert in that area, but I feel that those you know those livelihood issues, housing, uh, education, uh, the physical environment, um, environmental protection, and so on, and the, the, these are things which which many people in Hong Kong care about and which you know we ought to have an opportunity to do something about now I personally feel that the 
the, the post-2022 Hong Kong government perhaps has made a slightly slow start on this, although we're only six or seven months into, into their term. And I hope we can see more real progress on livelihood and development over the coming years. Mm -hmm. Daniel? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would basically just second what Tim is saying on this, that I think it needs to be a focus on livelihood. Um, I, you know, a lot of the, and the housing question for sure, you know, there's the big plans around the new towns and the reclamation, but these are so many years down the line. It doesn't mean a heck of a lot to people living in cramped quarters. It doesn't mean a lot to young people who want to live on their own and that kind of thing, right? So, and I know there's, they're trying to speed up some of the bureaucratic processes to get the stuff built more, but I think that they can and should do a whole lot more on that in the, in the short term. Um, so I think that's it. And then, um, I mean, I uh, the point around like voting suffrage, procedural issues, legal issues, legal issues are even separate from that. Um, those are all terribly important, and I wouldn't want to want to gainsay those. But I think that it's true that the legitimacy of the government, uh, the legitimacy of the society, there needs to be something else there. Basically, forms of welfare, forms of uh, opportunity that you can believe in, right? That that really need to be there. Um, and schooling, um, I think there's a lot going on with the public schooling now too, um, not just ideologically, but other changes. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on kids and on the parents of kids, just this, as, as they say here, that the kind of duck stuffing um, mode of education and so much exam-based stuff tremendous amounts of pressure that I think that they need to back off on that too. Um, and that will make people I hope happier, basically, right? So that those kinds of things, yeah. Okay, we're running out of time, uh, but actually I just wanted to read one comment from this gentleman or, or I don't know, I don't know the gender with the initial JS and this is to Daniel. I'm waiting with bated breath for the sequel of his book after <laughs> China will take over Taiwan. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. We're I don't know if I'm going to touch that one. We're running out of time, but before yeah. I close today's session, let me thank all three speakers today for joining our CCS webinar session for their very lively and inspiring dialogue. And to our audience, thank you very much for your comments and questions. And please check the chat forum for the information to our three speakers, you know, fabulous publications, right? But uh, their email addresses is also available. If you write to us, we can share that with you. And please don't forget to fill out the survey. And last but not least, uh, our next CCS webinar is in is on February 8th. It's another book launch, Interdiscipl Interdisciplinary Faculty Dialogue, on the monograph Friendship and Hospitality, the Jesuit Confusion Encounter in Late Ming China, published by Dr. Dong Feng Xu, Colgate University, and in conversation with Dr. Wen Shen Wang from our history department here at UH Manoa, and Dr. Zhou Yichun from Stanford University's East Asian Languages Department. So that, again, that's our next CCS webinar on February 8th. So please join us. And again, thanks to our three speakers today, to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Vukovic, Dr. Summers, and to Dr. Peterson. Thank you very much for your lively discussion. Thank you all Thank so you much. for inviting us. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for inviting. Thank you. All right.